The Cinema Specialist, Phil and John, are back. And tonight, episode number two, if you haven't seen that, and I'll tell you what, most of you haven't seen episode number one. So if you're listening to this, go watch episode number one. We talked about Godzilla from 1954 and Godzilla from 1998. John and I thought that that would be a fun podcast to do when Godzilla X Kong came out. Our lowest viewed video since we started doing the podcast, since all the way back doing our top 100 lowest viewed video so go back and take pity on us and just watch that one but anyway we're here for episode number two we also recorded that at 11 o'clock in the morning on like a monday or something so who knows what was actually going on we didn't help ourselves but today we are talking about john wick and we are talking about hard boiled so if you are new to what this series what this series what this, john and i have done our top 100 movies of all time and then obviously john and i went through the marvel movies we have not finished all the marvel movies that will be finishing at an another date right before deadpool and wolverine come out but this is going to be the series now. You haven't seen that. And this episode, more so than the first episode, really tells you what we're trying to accomplish with this series. One of the movies is going to be incredibly popular. We're, if you haven't seen it, sorry, I don't know what just happened. Where if you haven't seen it, it's a question of how in the world have you not seen that movie? Like where, what rock have you been living under that you have missed this movie? And the other one is you should see this movie. And that is John Wick from 2014 and Hard Boiled from 1992. So I think these two movies perfectly encapsulate this. I'm really excited to dive into both of these. The reason we went with these this week is because Monkey Man, Dev Patel's movie, came out this weekend or it's coming out this weekend. Did it come out yet or is it coming out this weekend? I'm yeah, it came out on Friday. Thrown off. Okay, I'm so thrown off. And I know that that's like an action John Wick type movie. So that's what we're here to do. We're here to do the action type John Wick movie. And I'm really excited to break these two down and have ourselves a little bit of fun. So, John, obviously you had never seen Hard Boiled, because why would you have? I mean, while we were going through our top 100, I did mention that I thoroughly enjoy Hong Kong cinema. But Hard Boiled is one that I hadn't gotten around to yet. And boy, oh boy, what a ride that movie is. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm like dying over here. John, keep talking. I got to drink water. Hold on. I, this is a really interesting episode because through all of our top 100, through all of the Marvel movies, we haven't really talked pure action movies at all. No. Like, no. We've, we've talked a bit of like action adventure movies. Uh, I would say some of our more, our patron podcasts have been closer to action movies than some of our others. But even when we're going through the MCU, like, Superhero movies aren't action movies per se. Not the way that these movies are action movies. Yes. And it's such a refreshing genre every once in a while. Because when you find a good action movie, you can turn all your brain off. You can just sit there and engage with it. And you're so enthralled, you just don't want to turn away. And these two movies do it in a completely different way mm -hmm. completely different john wick is super smooth krav maga like we are beating each other up so calculated and hard boiled is just a mess it is just a sloppy fat flat out mess and i mean that with all respect because i love this movie i gave it four stars i can't wait to talk about it i actually like it more than john wick I do too. but it is a 90s movie it is 90s cinema it is not clean cut the fight scenes are not super clean. Uh, the action sequences are all over the place, but it's so much fun to watch. So Hard Boiled and John Wick kind of show the evolution of what happened in 22 years, right? As an audience in 1992, it was slow motion, shooting, spraying bullets everywhere, break things like, let's just do it. And by 2014, that had turned into, I want precision. Mm -hmm. I want this shot. I mean, there's a scene in John Wick, which we'll talk about, where he literally goes through the entire room, and I think he hits every single shot. It's just a matter of, does he kill him with one shot, or does he take multiple shots to kill the person he's aiming at? And it's absolutely brilliant, but I think that a lot of this does go to video games. Mm -hmm. And I think that video games, because Call of Duty and those types of games, no scope, right? Like you would just shoot somebody and they would die without using the scope. That was always the bit. That's how you knew you were good at Call of Duty is if you could no scope. And because of that, that became what audiences expected because they were seeing it 
when they would sit down, when they play a video game with their friends and they would do whatever, as opposed to just, you know, up until 1992, what video game, there was no video game that had this. I mean, maybe you went to an arcade and you could do a shooting game, but that was going to be a totally different environment. So it's fun to see how that really, really did change over time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of what it comes down to is when you watch hard boiled, even as a nineties movie, it feels older than that it still feels like this hangover from the 80s action genre with the sensibility of john woo directing and everything but it still feels like a movie from a bygone era and when we get into john wick and john wick gave us such a resurgence for the action movie after it came out because i mean what we have like six john wick movies now five is it five in a series something like that? no it's four in a series it's four in a okay series. four in a series there, there are a ton of them. They keep making them. We have other movies in the style of John Wick, like Nobody. Um, and, and of course, like these are kind of all spinning off of things like The Raid as well. Mm-hmm. Action movies are just the easiest thing to do. And the precision of it, the cleanness of it, it's, it's like filmmakers took the sensibility of making a high class drama and started applying it to action movies when John Wick came out. Yeah, John Wick had no expectations when it came out. You know, that mm. that's something that really I find quite funny about John Wick is when John Wick was originally released, there wasn't a lot of excitement for this movie. I mean, maybe after it premiered, but it wasn't like people were sitting there, "Oh my god, the new Keanu Reeves movie. It's coming mm. out. Wait until you see this thing." It's not what people were doing. And he had obviously had the success with the matrix, which is another, like one of those types of, movies. but it's not an action movie. I feel like the matrix is an action movie, but it's not an action movie like this. There's more of a story mm-hmm. to it. It's not a revenge plot. That was more of look at what we can do with special effects. Whereas John wick, that's not what the movie's doing. One of the best shots in this movie is when they're in the nightclub mm-hmm. and he gets thrown off the balcony and it's no cuts. And you're waiting for the cut to show him land. And instead he just hits the ground. And it's like the camera couldn't keep up with how fast he was going to hit the ground. That shot is absolutely incredible. And that is what these movies, that's like, you know, where a movie like The Matrix, it was look at the special effects. This was look at what we can accomplish in camera. And I'm sure there's Mm -hmm. different types of, you know, there's different things going on there that we don't see as an audience. But you're seeing some movie magic there. And that was what was a lot of fun with that. So, um yeah, I'm I'm really excited to talk about the, both of these movies. If you're listening, make sure you like the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Do all that stuff, all the important stuff. If you're listening over on Twitter. I do have this one going out to X. So if you're listening over there, head on over to YouTube. Leave some comments. Do all that fun stuff. Let us know what you think of these movies. If you hadn't been introduced to Hard Boiled, any of that stuff, excited to break this one down and uh, and really dive into these. So, yeah, John, you want to – but what, what, what was your experience with Hard Boiled here? What was your expectations when you saw the poster of this man holding a baby? Yeah, so that was the second Hard Boiled poster I seen. The the first one I saw was the like, uh, I think the American That's the one poster I is different with yeah. with just um, Chow Young Fat's face and like the flamey background. Is it fire mm-hmm. in the background? Something like that. And yeah, it's he's like, got okay. the gun. It's very, it's yeah. very, very dramatic 90s. You know, it's very understandable here. And when we were talking about this movie and it came up that there, there's this other cover existed with Cho Yun Fat holding this baby. I was like, what does this have to do with anything? Mm-hmm. The amount of time spent in the maternity ward in this movie cannot be understated. Because oh, yeah, holy totally. cow, these babies are such a pivotal point to this plot for no reason. And it's fantastic the entire time because of it. And again, it's leaning into the 90s, right? That's what I yeah. think this was doing. It's like, oh, here's our hero. He's going to save the babies. That's what we're looking at. This is going to be super cool. And it does have a very 90s Asian cinema feel to it of that mm. whole sequence. What's really amazing about Hard Boiled is there might only be 20 sequences in this movie. Mm -hmm. Now, a normal movie, you have a bunch of scenes. You might have a hundred scenes, depending on the movie, the type of movie that's being made. You might have more, but in terms of sequences, you'll have scenes that then lead into other scenes and whatever. This movie has very few sequences. That hospital scene, I'd count that as one sequence. And that's what 45 minutes of the movie. 
you have the warehouse, you have the tea shop, um, you have, uh, what's the other one? The boat. Like, mm-hmm. these are the sequences that you're seeing throughout this movie. And yeah. so for me, while I'm watching this, I think it's so incredible what they were able to pull off because they're not trying to be quick, snippy, boom, boom, boom. Here we go. Get in, get out. How many people is he going to kill? You're When you're watching John Wick, you're almost keeping track of the kill count as yeah. you're going along. And I think that's fascinating because you are almost playing it as if you were playing a a first person shooter of saying, okay, how many did he get? How many did he get? How many did he get? Is there going to be more? I wish I had a view of the map so I could see what was going on around the corner. You know, it's those kinds of things. And so what I really like about this movie was it was like, no, it's going to be a mess. You're not going to be able to track who's the good guy, who's the bad guy, who are the cops, who aren't the cops. It's just, and they're wearing all these nice baggy 90s clothes, which I really appreciated about all of these sequences. And it's just a mess. But because it's a mess, we can watch them destroy glass, destroy tables, destroy plates, destroy everything over and over and over and over again and never get tired of it. And that's really fun. I really do love that. And and I wish more movies, I don't think we'll ever see the style go back to this, Mm -hmm. but I really do wish more movies would take the chances with, It doesn't have to be crisp. It doesn't have to be clean. It's almost like now when you watch a trailer for a movie, you can tell it's an AI generated trailer because Mm -hmm. when you watch the trailer for the movie, not that it's not that it's generated, but it's AI is telling them this is what you should put in. You know, it's like they're sitting there saying, this is what audiences want. This is the exact line of dialogue. Let's make sure that all goes in. But then it feels emotionless. And we've talked about this a lot on this podcast of There are certain trailers where I feel like it's a movie that should be for either John or I. And then we watch the trailer and I say, no, it doesn't feel like it's for me. And then you end up turning around a couple weeks later and it's like, nope, I watched it and that movie was for me. But why didn't the trailer convey this? We're not getting the blue Valentine type trailer anymore. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the same thing happens with action movies. We just watched, we talked about it in one of our podcasts and it was a horrible one, but it has more views than our damn Godzilla thing. So please go watch the Godzilla one. Um, And that is the, uh, what, whatever the Kingsman guy, what's it, what's that uh, Argyle it's yes, garbage, yeah. but it is very much that look how precise, look at the precision I can have. Look at all of these moments. Look at the, Oh, it's so succinct. Isn't this great? It's not. And that's a movie that probably would have been benefiting from being sloppy, but mm-hmm. nowadays it's so much about spy, uh, superhuman type things. A movie like nobody, it kind of works because you're not expecting Bob Odenkirk yeah. to be that everyday man who's doing that. But not everything has to be John Wick. But I don't know if we'll ever see somebody have the guts, a studio especially, to make a movie like Hard Boiled, which was what a lot of 90s action movies were. It was just blow things up for the hell of blowing things up. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why John Woo was given the second Mission Impossible movie. It's because the name he made for himself making these Hong Kong action films was huge. And... What Hard Boiled manages to do, which so many action movies fail to do, is keep the action going almost relentlessly throughout its two-hour and eight-minute run. Yeah, I, I think those eight minutes are the main, those those are the minutes without action in this movie. It might and be he, like when they're when they're in the police hall and they're and they're making their really quippy '90s remarks. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have like, oh, now we got to figure out what the code is. Oh, what's the jingle? What's the music? Let's ding dong ding, you know, whatever that is. Yeah. Uh, And then the other two hours of this movie is nonstop action. And it never, what a lot of movies have a problem with with action is the action can feel tiring. It can feel exhausting at times. Hard boy, it doesn't feel that way. No. It's moving so much. It moves, it, it focuses enough on our, our main character of tequila and then brings in um, Alan, uh, Tony, mm-hmm. Tony Leung's character. And it's able to show us just enough different perspective during these action sequences to keep you invested the entire time, keep you watching the entire time. And even in this 45 minute hospital sequence, which gets absolutely ridiculous and has a three minute no cut hallway action scene leading so into good. the elevator. It's so fantastic. It it's cutting to uh, Tequila's girl as she is referred to in this movie. 
Yep. And, and her attempts to rescue the babies because the babies need to be taken out of the hospital because they're afraid the hospital is going to blow up and everything. And it's just cutting just enough where it's like, okay, get us back to the action. We need more of the action. And even that try to get the babies out plot feels so high stakes the entire mm-hmm. time, despite the fact that it goes on for a third of the movie. Yeah, I think I think something to do with that is just the fact that the stakes, like you said, they feel high the entire time. And that's that's in the director's hands. You know, the yeah. director seems to make it feel that way. And I think that is because they don't spend time over explaining. And that's mm-hmm. a compliment to John Wick as well. Right. Yes. When you watch John Wick, obviously now we've seen a bunch of them. We have Shane Cup over here. OK, guys, looks like I'm in a safe space. I've never seen any of the John Wick movies. And then Raptor 8415 says I somehow haven't seen John Wick either. I'm shocked by that. But then at the same time, I'm not. I actually watch these as two, three, one, two, three, four. That's how I watch them. I missed the first one when it came out because it looked like a Mm -hmm. stupid Keanu Reeves had made nothing but crap movies for a while before the John Wick movie came out. Yeah, it was was before the Keanu songs that we got after John Wick. Yeah, it was. And we got that because of John Wick. Mm -hmm. And so all of that is just to say when I'm sitting there and I'm watching and and, and I watch this movie. They don't take a lot of time to explain the continental, what the coins mean, that you can't kill on. It's it's quick one lines. Mm-hmm. That's what makes a good action movie. You can have – I'm not saying omit the story. That's not what I'm saying at all. Stories are incredibly important to action movies, just like they're incredibly important to comedies, dramas. It doesn't matter. I think sometimes action directors say, oh, we're just going to blow things up. Okay, but if it's nonsense, it's nonsense. Hard Boiled doesn't waste – it knows that you know that this is a very basic – Mm-hmm. There is an an undercover cop. There is not an undercover cop. Not undercover cop is trying to take down the mobster, but so is the undercover cop. And how are they going to work together? Will they be able to? It's very much the departed, infernal affairs. Yeah. It's all that stuff. So it doesn't waste its time bogging itself down with nonsensical exposition. It just lets the movie play out the way it needs to play out. So I... Love that for this movie. And that's why I think it's so memorable and why it works so well. Is this the greatest story I've ever seen put on film? No, obviously not. But the tea house scene, which is 15 minutes long or whatever to start the movie, you don't need to know the details of everything that's going on in that scene while you're watching everybody just get shot up. Because by the end of that scene, you see his partner, whoever it is, get shot and you say, oh, I get it. Okay, cool. That's going to be, you know, I mean, when you read the synopsis, actually, I wish I had the DVD with me. If I was home, I would have the DVD. I'm in North Carolina. So, um, but let me just see real quick, because this is so worth it. If you can just read the, if you can just read the actual synopsis. Here you go. You ready? 1992. This is the beauty of 1992. Here we go. A tough as nails cop teams up with an undercover agent to shut down a sinister mobster and his crew. And John, that's a four star movie. If I gave you that same log line now or that same synopsis right now, you'd say, oh, God, that's going to be rough. But it's not. It's freaking brilliant because it wasn't complicated. It just was what it was. But anyway, go ahead, John. Jump in. It's the simplicity of Hard Boiled that really makes it so good. Uh, Mm -hmm. And in contrast, when we're looking at the simplicity of John Wick, I one thing I really noticed this time around, and I, I also have Hard Boils a better movie than John Wick, and that's yeah. no offense to John Wick. It's just Hard Boils that good of a movie. John Wick does such a phenomenal job at world building with so little exposition in the movie. I agree. Yeah, like immediately we're thrown in. We kind of get that, you know, that Mission Impossible three start where we're we're thrown thrust in to almost the end of the movie it's kind of setting things up and we're like okay what's going on here uh we but it tells us so much it's like okay john does something dangerous that's Mm -hmm. all we have to know about this character then we get the flashback we find out that you know his wife's dying and then dies and we get the introduction of willem dafoe's marcus and you're like who's this guy And then as we progress, you just, you get an idea of what's happening. And then eventually you hear the phone call that he keeps listening to, Mm -hmm. which is what we hear at the beginning of the movie. And there is the little snippets because like when he gets to the gas station and the Russians come up, um, Alfie Alfie Allen, Allen, Alfie Allen, yep. 
and and he speaks to them in Russian. You're like, oh, mm -hmm. oh, wait, I know where this is going. Or yeah. then when the Russians do finally come to his house and the cop comes by and it's like, are you working again, John? <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, like this is like deep stuff that he is involved with. And it's just those little moments. It's um, it's Lance Reddick's character at the Continental. Just like setting everything up so that you know what everything is at the Continental the entire time. Hey, we have to pay these people double so they can break hotel rules. It, it, John, John Wick doesn't have a bunch of complexity to it. Mm -hmm. But it just has it has just enough that it can deliver through single lines and, and things we see on screen. It feels like one of the deepest action movies of all time. The yeah. fact that like when oh, I mean we're getting into the spoiler territory, everyone. Sorry. I mean but, everybody knows what they're getting yeah. into here. I feel like we can only talk around stuff so much, right? But the fact that the inciting incident of this of John Wick is his dog dying. Like his dog mm -hmm. being killed in the home invasion as they're trying to steal his car. It seems ridiculous when you explain that to someone. Mm -hmm. Man's dog dies. He decides to go take down the Russian mob. But when you're watching the movie and you realize this dog was a gift from his dead wife. And is like this surrogate for his wife. So when he loses it, it's like losing his wife all over again. Yep. And... and like, that's the complexity of this movie that David Leach puts into it. And it's an hour and a half action movie of Keanu Reeves just decimating everyone in the film. Yeah, he just decimates everybody. He just decimates absolutely everybody. And do you think that, so obviously, like you were just talking about, like, John Wick has the humor involved. John Wick mm -hmm. knows the comedy that it's going for. It understands that to stand out now, it doesn't have a choice but to go these comedic routes because yeah. if you don't have a sense of humor about you when you're making these types of action movies now, especially when it's like the, you know, they used to call these the Steven Seagal movies, the Chuck yeah. Norris movies. That's what it used to be. But now it they do try to make themselves. They are, they are art. I mean, at the end mm -hmm. of the day, there's that scene. I mean, that scene in the club with that song playing, where it's yep. like the lo-fi beat. Oh my God. And it's like the girl just kind of talking over it. I should have looked up what the name of that song was. Maybe song was maybe song. When I was watching that, it's like, it's amazing. But this movie knew that it had to learn from its predecessors and it needed to lean into that style or it was never going to work. This needed to be a damn good time or nobody was going to go see the movie, see the movie, see the movie. with hard boiled. It knew it needed to be a damn good time, but, there's not as much humor in this movie. There is a little, <clears throat> but there's yeah. not a lot. And I have to call. Yeah. So John, get in. Yeah. I mean, I, and I find the humor in hard boiled is more, I feel like it's probably funnier for someone from Hong Kong who understands a lot of the humor in it. And, and we as North American viewers watching this movie, don't get a lot of the humor, but the still some of the humor lands, right? Like at the end of the movie, as he's carrying this baby out of the hospital, and it pees on him so he doesn't catch fire. Mm hmm That's hilarious. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's also like, I can't believe this just happened in this movie. Yeah, so I guess there is quite a bit of humor. Because I guess then, like, some of the stuff with the in the hospital and everything. But what, what cracks me up is, like, and, and I'm saying this because we're talking about an Asian film. Like, this movie mm, is from yeah. Hong Kong, like you said. And there are those moments of just pure 90s Asian cinema. Mm -hmm. Such as the villainous guy who's not really, you're not sure if he's a villain or not, having an eye patch the entire time. Fantastic. And his so like heroic moment and how he goes about that and like his heel turn or whatever, or his opposite of a heel turn. In the 90s, yeah. this was like, oh my gosh, where did that come from? Whereas now we're watching it, we're like, yes, this is the expectation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But the groundwork had to be laid at some point. It just happened to be laid like 30 plus years ago. But I love those things. And you do see, I don't know if Hard Boiled necessarily influenced John Wick, mm -hmm. but it influenced the movies that influenced John Wick. And yeah. I will say that if you were asking me, you know, every genre has its important movies. The mob genre, yes, you get to The Godfather, and now that's 52 years old, so people are going to sit there and say, wow, that really started... No. Without Little Caesar and Scarface, mm -hmm. I'm talking the original Scarface. Yeah. I'm not talking about, obviously, the one that came after The Godfather. That would make no sense. But without that, without White Heat, 
without those James Cagney movies, Angels with Dirty Faces, The Godfather doesn't exist. And you look at comedies. Yeah, you can say now that like in terms of, let's say, romantic comedies, because it's an easier one to nail down. When Harry Met Sally, a movie we did for the Patreon. That is, if you want to be a patron, patreon.com slash specialist, you get all of the $5 Tuesdays already done. So you can jump in at any time and you can start listening to the ones we have back. But that's a movie that really set the tone for that genre. But it wasn't the first romantic comedy. There were plenty that came before that. Mm -hmm. And Hard Boiled is one of those quintessential action movies, though. Because as far back as you can go with action, Robin Hood is an action movie, 1939. I mean, that's an action movie. There are action movies for sure from back in the day. But a lot of them fell into other genres. Like you were saying, John, then you get action adventure. Star Mm -hmm. Wars, is that an action movie? No, that's a fantasy sci-fi movie. Like that is different, even though there's a lot of action in it. This is a pure action movie. And there are movies. I'm not saying that there aren't movies before this that aren't just pure action movies. There are. But Hard Boiled is one of the most important action movies to ever exist. And I would love to hear if David Leach at all was inspired by Hard Boiled when he was making this. Because I guarantee you everybody else in the 90s sure is the the Wachowskis Mm -hmm. 100% were inspired by Hard Boiled when they sat down to make The Matrix. Yeah, absolutely. And it is one of those movies that when people talk action movies, people talk Hard Boiled. And yes, we're in a time now where people talk that same way about John Wick, but like you said, John Wick doesn't exist without Hard Boiled. And, and I think there are some pretty direct correlations between the two movies, just with the way that they're shot, the way that it's done. Again, those long action sequences that are done in single takes, that's a Hard Boiled thing. Like, that's just something mm-hmm. Hard Boiled did. And it You think it, it inspired uh, Chan, was it Chan Wu Park when he made Old Boy? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. I mean, that scene where they're in the hallway, probably yeah. the greatest, probably the greatest action shot in the history of film is the scene, the hallway scene in Old Boy. Mm-hmm. If you have not seen Old Boy, that movie is one, insanely disturbing, but two, it is legitimately the most incredibly filmed thing I have ever seen in my life. Came out in 2003. Um, mm-hmm. It's actually on Netflix right now, but I don't know if they have it non-dubbed a lot of times when netflix get that movie Mm, they only get the dubbed version which is a pain in the ass and a terrible way to watch it but i'm not talking about the spot don't go watch the spike lee one i'm talking about the og cham wook park one that one is amazing and that scene is incredible that's coming from hard boiled baby like that is coming from hard boiled so um it's funny to me what do you think it is john about the international films that actually are able to stand the test of time because A movie, and I'm talking about more like genre-based films, right? Because a movie like Old Boy is still discussed a lot. I mean, Spike Mm -hmm. Lee did remake it. Obviously, it wasn't a good remake, but he did remake it. It's a movie that's always up there. It has an 8.3 on IMDb. It's got great reviews over all over the place. But what is it about a movie like Hard Boiled that doesn't keep it in the vernacular? I'd never even heard of Hard Boiled until 2019. When somebody said to me, how the hell have you not seen that movie? And I said, seen it. I've never even heard of it. And I sat down and watched it and I said, holy shit. (laughs) I think when it comes to Hard Boiled, John Woo never got the traction in North America that people thought he was going to. That's fair. Right? I mean, you think about John Woo's big break in the States. It was Mission Impossible 2. That movie is not good. It's terrible. Well, Face Off off was a very... Yeah, fun movie for yeah. sure, for Absolutely. sure. But I don't think people realize John Woo directed Face Off. And yeah, it's more of a Nicolas Cage movie. And I think the other problem is because that's a Nicolas Cage movie, because Mission Impossible Two is a Mission Impossible movie. They're not the type of movies that you're like, oh, I should look into this director and see why he got these movies in the first place. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and and it's really unfortunate. And I also think <clears throat> cinema from Hong Kong, China, doesn't permeate North American culture as much as Japanese films and Korean films do now. I agree with that. I do agree with that. And I think that I think there is a massive cultural difference. I mean, Mm -hmm. the claustrophobia for me of of this movie is that the whole thing is just in cities. Like it's just the cityscape, 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 because Hong Mm -hmm. Kong is what the most it's the most populous. I know it's not a country anymore, but it's the most populous. Uh, territory in the entire world there's just it's just people on top of people on top of people and you see that you feel that claustrophobia in these movies the shootouts are taking place in warehouses and tea houses and 
in hospitals, but there's people always all over the place. And mm. it very much goes the Avengers route where it's like, we're just going to shoot everybody. We don't really give a shit. We're going to yeah. kill anybody at any time. And it does not matter. Um, but yeah, that's, I think, I think you're right. I do think there's a difference there. And I think what worked with Japanese cinema was Japanese cinema tried to get more to the heart of it right mm -hmm. away. Like if you go back, I, I talked about over the summer, the human condition, brilliant. Yeah trilogy it's really one movie but it's a trilogy six parts whatever the hell it is it's so many different things but it's brilliant and it is human the human story hong kong cinema wasn't doing john woo never set out to do the human story john yeah. woo set out to make badass action movies and he did a hell of a job at it but john without looking at his without looking at his his uh Filmography? directing credits yeah. Can you name a movie other than Mission Impossible 2 Face Off and Hard Boiled that he directed? Oh, I have it. It's on the tip of my tongue. It's the one that he made in 1989. Because that's the other one that gets compared with Hard Boiled a lot. It's the other, like, big one. I can't remember the name of it, though. So that one, he made two in 1989. But the one that you're thinking of is The Killer. Um, yeah. Yeah, the killer is the one. I've actually never seen the killer. That's one that I definitely want to check out. Mm -hmm. But that is that is one. He also did Red Cliff, which right. I yeah. have at home, but I have not watched. I own the DVD. I actually got it from a, a like a what do you call those? Like a potluck kind of thing. You throw all the DVDs in, you can just okay. take out whatever you want. When I was working at Warner Brothers, somebody didn't want Red Cliff, so I have Red Cliff. Um, but I haven't watched it yet. Those are the only ones I could think of off the top of my head. I did not know he directed Wind Talkers. Um, oh. I, I found that out right now. So I've seen wind talkers, but didn't know it was him. That's a Nicholas cage war movie. Um, so yeah, anyway, I just think that also does hurt him, right? We talked about Michael Cimino when I did my deer hunter as my favorite movie of all time, Michael Cimino never did anything else worth noting. Uh, mm -hmm. he did heaven's gate. He did thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Those are the only two movies he literally ever directed other than the deer hunter. I enjoy heaven's gate. I've never seen thunderbolt and Lightfoot, but like, that's why people don't go back and revisit the deer hunter all the time hard boiled Chow Yun Fat and Tony Leung. You could argue that they're the two most worldwide in the 90s. Mm -hmm. They were the two most popular actors in the world. And you might say no they weren't. You had was Asian I, cinema, that's what it was about. You weren't yeah. getting as many movies in America going over to Asia to make the amount of money. Yeah, a Star Wars or something that comes out in 99, that's a different story. But Tony Leung and Chow Yun Fat were massive, and Michelle Yeoh too, which people forget mm -hmm. because of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. But hey, who's in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon again, John? Oh, would that be uh, Chow Yun Fat and Michelle Yeoh and, and Michelle Yeoh. Tony yeah. and, and is Tony, Tony Leung in there too? It's been a while since I've watched Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Is it Tony? No, no, no. Tony Leung is not in it. But anyway, anyway, so Chow Yun Fat though and Michelle Yeoh. Chow Yun Fat was massive. He yeah, was massive. Huge, huge. And, and I think I think a lot of people our age don't conflate that because the movies he was coming out in weren't the movies that we were being shown. We were being seeing the Jackie Chans and the Jet Li films. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and when we conflate to Hong Kong cinema a lot of times, it is those more like wire foo movies that were of the early 2000s that I think we think about a lot more than something like this. And even even the wire foo of like the nineties with like once upon a time in China, there's, mm. it, it's just this different style of movie where I think the, dare I say like novelty of Kung Fu movies kind of overshadows a lot of regular action films or even dramatic films from Hong Kong and China. Yeah, I can agree with that for sure. I mean, I don't know if I could name a single dramatic film from Hong Kong. In the mood for love. Oh, okay. I screwed up. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, I, okay. So, and um, what's that other one um, from 1994? Uh, Chung King Express? Chung King Express. Yeah, yeah. So they're all the same. What's his name? Is yeah. that Park? That's Park, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, now we're gonna sound stupid. We got to get well. Our fun fact: I haven't them. seen either of those movies. So, Chung King Express. I'm gonna say it out loud right now. It's overrated. Um, I enjoy it, but it's overrated. I remember going into that movie being like, "Wow, this is gonna be the greatest thing of all time." And then maybe that's people, why I think people it's overrated. Do love that movie. It's Wong Kar Wai. Thank you, okay, Wong Kar Wai. I could not think of Wong Kar Wai's name. Um, 
Yeah, Wong Kar Wai. People love that movie. They yes. love it. And guess who's in that? I have no idea. Is it Tony? Tony Leung? Leung. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. Wow. It's insane. Wow. I know. It's insane. I, yeah. Uh, but one of the most interesting things that I find about Hard Boiled, every person you ask is going to answer a different action scene that is their favorite action scene in the movie. What is yours? I like the hospital sequence. Damn. Specifically, I, I do like that the the one take down the hallway. I think it's just mm -hmm. a phenomenal filmmaking. Uh, but just the hospital sequence in general, like all 45 minutes of it, when they first get into the morgue and just start like shooting everyone down there, it's great. Even like the moment where it pulls it in a little bit and they're trying to figure out how to open the electronic door and they're like, mm -hmm. pouring the gunpowder out of their bullets and stick it in the pipe. I, I just think that entire sequence is so fun. Yeah, I uh, I go with the warehouse because for me, the warehouse scene, it's like, how is it going to continue to escalate? How is it going to continue to escalate? And it just keeps escalating. It's so mm -hmm. ridiculous and so over the top. And it just does not stop. Every time you think, okay, we've reached the climax of this scene. Something else is blowing up. Someone else is getting shot. It just keeps going. I mean, when Tony Leung shoots everybody there after killing the one guy, then he kills all the other guys. And then it just leads into this, like, like it's just so much fun. Because in that scene, what you have is you have gang versus gang. Mm -hmm. That sequence ends. And now here comes tequila to to, yeah. to save the day so now you have cop versus gang so you have to have all of that going on and i mean when you think about the dialogue of this movie you have lines of i told you to stay away from that i'm taking you off the case it's shit like that the entire time but when you get to the shot in the warehouse where they are holding the guns at each other's heads and tony leung just drops it you're like okay this like that is such an epic standoff mm -hmm. no matter what and it is preceded by one of the most ridiculous sequences you will ever see in film and it's so expertly directed i mean granted john woo was in love with slow motion he was in love yeah. with birds we all know that that's the trademark of all of his movies but my god that sequence is just absolutely absolutely breathtaking and my favorite by by a lot actually of the yep. movie like i i really love the hospital scene i really love the other sequences but that's my favorite by far yeah and, and then, like that's the beauty of this movie because i think there are a lot of people who could be listening to this podcast who have never seen this movie before will watch this movie and be like the tea house sequence is my favorite sequence in the movie mm. uh and all i saw or all i thought during that sequence was a this is really cool and b why are there so many birds in this tea house yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, he loves, he loves birds, But it's, it's John Wick, so it makes sense. Yeah, he loves birds. I don't know if I have a moment like that in John Wick. See, to me, it's it's that scene. I got to figure out the song. Song from the, uh, John the nightclub Wick scene in the red. It's called the Red O, right? I think so. The Red Circle. That's what I'm it gonna is. I'm going to be honest. It's harder for me to remember John Wick than it is for me to remember Hard Boiled. Um, all right, you keep talking. I'm going to figure out which song yeah. it is. I guess, I guess when I'm thinking about it, I do. I think the thing with John Wick is I don't have a favorite action sequence in that. I have a. I think my favorite scene is when Alfie Allen brings the Mustang to John Leguizamo, and he immediately knows who the car belongs to. Like, and that, and, and again, it's that that universe building there, that that building of. Okay, we're building up the legacy of John Wick and the legend of John Wick. So much so that when um, the main bad guy in this movie, whose name I cannot remember whatsoever. The Russian. Uh, the, yes. Oh, wait, it's actually his name, isn't it? It's actually just the Russian. Um, Is it? I think it, I think it, I think they literally do call him the Russian for some of the movie, but let me see. Tarasov. Um, uh, yeah. Tarasov. The uh, Russian. Yeah. But when... When Tarasov phones uh, John Leguizamo and says, oh, hey, I heard you, like, turn my kid down or whatever. And he's like, yeah, because he brought in Sean Wick's car and he killed his dog. Like, it's that, it's that beat Best of... 
best line of either of these movies is Tarasov's response. What is it again? Oh, and he just yeah, hangs up the phone. Exactly. That's the best line yeah. of either of these movies because like you're saying, that tells you everything you need to know about who John Wick is. It's yeah. brilliant. Before you've even seen John Wick, you've only seen up to that point John Wick get his ass kicked. Mm -hmm. And yet, as soon as he hangs up that phone, I laugh every time because I'm just like, all he said was, oh. And you know that this powerful man just said, fuck. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And, and And again, that's what John Wick does so well. Because and, and we do get like the exposition about John Wick, like the Bobby Yaga of it all. And I, if you listen to our Ant Man and the Wasp video, I talk about how Bobby Yaga has that effect on me because I, I just know that Russian folklore and everything. Bobby Yaga is a terrifying character. So having this man named Bobby Yaga, and what they say he he's the assassin who takes out the assassins, mm -hmm. right? Like he's he's the one who makes other people in the industry scared. I, it, it, that's the type of character building we get. And it, it's funny because a lot of the time, Phil, you and I will complain about this type of exposition because mm -hmm. it's it's a lot of tell, don't show. It works so well in this movie because you don't need to see it because we have to understand that the characters have seen it. Yes, exactly. And, and I think what it is about this is it's leaning into the mystique of everything. It's mm -hmm. not being exposition for being this for the sake of exposition. It is making an artistic decision to not show him beating people up to tell you who he is. Yep. You know who he is. So then when he goes over and he gets into the continental mm -hmm. and they all recognize him and he's talking to people and every, Oh, so you're doing this again. And you see him digging under even before he gets to the continental to get the gold. You know exactly what this man is capable of. And now you're just waiting for the explosions to happen. Mm -hmm. And that is beautiful tension building. That's world building. That's tension. That is understanding the assignment as the kids say. And uh, Leach totally, totally understood the assignment with this movie. He just did. Whereas hard boiled, you had to, start with the action scene you couldn't build up to Keela in that way but i do think a lot of movies nobody i gave four stars nobody i actually think is a better movie than john wick even though it's probably you know it is very much a spin it's like oh my son beat you yeah. up you beat him up and now you're coming to take down me and my empire it's the same movie but with a yeah. different style to it and nobody does this it understood we have to set him up as a normal person then let it unfold there's too many movies that just in this new era of, of action movie want it to be my guy's a badass. Here is him doing badass stuff. Trust me, he's badass. That's it. That's the extent of the yep. movie. There is character development to John Wick by having other characters talk about how incredible he is at things. That is low budget cinema filmmaking right there. It is. But they don't have a low budget for this. They are just making the decision because when they get to the action sequences, they're not cheaping out on anything. It is no holds barred. Here we go. Get ready nonstop. So yeah, it's, it's just, it's just great, man. Like I really, I, I know I keep using that word, but like both of these movies just make you, they really show what film is capable of. Yes. And they both show also what audiences are willing to accept and what they're not willing to accept. And I think we talk about this a lot, but there's too many things that modern audiences, they have too high of expectations about certain things. There's mm -hmm. certain things where they want to nitpick. They want to complain. Everybody's a critic. Yeah, we've heard that our whole lives. But nowadays, people really are. Everybody really is a critic. I mean, you can go on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know what the requirements are, but we could put this video on Rotten yeah. Tomatoes. We literally could. Like, we yeah. could say the cinema specialist, boop, 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 put out a quote from us and throw it on Rotten Tomatoes. Like, it is not hard to make that happen. And I think that writers and directors and actors when they're choosing these projects all that they're thinking about that stuff now they're mm -hmm. thinking about it and they over explain and they overdo things and whatever these these movies show that audiences are willing to forgive they are willing to give you the benefit of the doubt on a lot but you it's have the, to entertain them it's the suspension of disbelief and it, it's something we don't refer to a lot in our movie like when we're talking about movies because a lot of movies you just buy in right away. But a good movie gives you that sense of suspension of disbelief where it doesn't matter how ridiculous something is. You believe it because of the world that it's set in.
because yeah. of everything else that they've built up. And that's what John Wick does. That's what Hard Boiled does. I don't know anything about the triads in Hong Kong in 1992. No idea. No, like I have a basis idea, but it's probably because of Hard Boiled. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay because I understand everything. And other things that these movies do is they go over the top with the villain, right? Uh, Alfie Allen kills a dog. That's like the cardinal sin of cinema. Yeah. And, and um, Johnny in Hard Boiled, you're like, okay, is he that bad? Like he's an arms dealer and everything. I get it. And then he just guns down a bunch of people at a hospital. Yeah. Yep. 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 It's I like, know. Oh, okay. Like this is the moment where it's like, this bad guy is bad. Yeah. And it's like, I didn't need this reinforcement because I've been following this protagonist. But now anything the protagonist does to this character is completely justified. Yep, exactly. And yeah, that's the scene in the red circle. The song that's playing is Think by Kaleida. Okay. I never heard of Kaleida until this moment. So it's Think by Kaleida. That song is so good for that scene. And that's the scene I go to. And that's when they're in mm. the baths. They're underground, yeah. whatever it is. And Alfie Allen is trying to get away. And like, that's mm -hmm. the only person for some reason when John Wick shoots his gun, it's the only one he can't hit. He hits everybody yeah. else square in the forehead every freaking time, but he can't hit him. And it, you're sitting there and you're rooting for it and the music and the style and the, the direction. And as he's killing people, you know that it's just, okay, I got to get through. I got to get through. I got to get through. It's almost like a football player, right? Yeah. It's like, I got to get to the end zone and I just have to push these people out of my way, but my focus is on the end zone. And if you're a defensive player, you got blockers in front of you. You're trying to tackle the running back. You're going, okay, I see the running back. Okay, get this guy out of my way. Get this guy out of my way. I got to get to the running back. That's what it feels like. I mean, he's just gunning through everybody just to get to that part. We get really cool action sequences out of it. Mm -hmm. I um, And then what I really appreciate about John Wick is when he does kill Alfie Allen, he just does it. There's yeah. no buildup. There's no hesitation no whatsoever. He just does it. And that yeah. is what is missing from these kinds of movies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it – there's so much time spent in film nowadays where writers, directors, whatever it is, studios feel like every action needs to be justified. Yeah. And they spend so much time with exposition. It, and they give the exposition dump when they're about to kill the bad guy. It's like nobody does that. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's the inverse of what we complain about in like Bond movies, right? I mean, we don't mm -hmm. complain about it because it's the trope, but it, it's the monologue, right? Like the villain mm -hmm. monologue. And that it doesn't make sense either, but that's because James Bond movies aren't a hundred percent serious, right? Like they aren't a serious action movie in the end until we get to like the Timothy Dalton era. Uh, but because of that, I don't know. It feels like studios and directors and writers feel like it's necessary for us to completely understand the motives of our characters at every given moment. And that we can't, you know, know what a character's feeling from 45 minutes earlier in the movie. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I, I feel like sometimes they get a little carried away. And and again, that's why I'm saying I really do appreciate that in this instance, they're not worried about it. They're just mm -hmm. doing it. Like it just it just is what it is. Um, all right. What else do you want to talk about with these two? I haven't seen Monkey Man. Do you plan on going to see Monkey Man? It might be some. I don't know if I'll go see it mainly because uh, there's a different movie coming out this week that I really want to go. I want to go see Civil War this week. Uh, that's where, if I'm going to the movies this what week, what are the that's reviews on that like? Are they good? I haven't looked yet. I just really like Alex Garland. So, yeah, I haven't looked, but I have not. Monkey Man's a movie that eventually I'm going to watch it. Like, yeah, I, I do really like Dev Patel, and I'm interested to see what his direction's like. Uh, obviously, um, Jordan Peele's behind him and producing this movie too. So it'll be interesting to see how this is handled. Uh, I've seen kind of mixed reviews for the movie so far, but most people seem to be landing in that like three star range that a lot of people do with these type of action movies. So, which is really what you want from these types of action movies, right? Like, am I wrong in yeah. saying that? That is what you. That is what you want from these. That's movies. what I expect. Out of these yeah. action movies. and then sometimes you get movies like the two we're talking about today that go above and beyond and they they mm -hmm. get the assignment and they do it better than anybody else but yeah exactly three stars is ultimately what we're looking for yeah and one of the ways that i think john wick 
does it better than a lot. John Wick spent so much time with the perfect casting in this movie. Like even and all the what, minor characters in the movie, yeah, are Lance so Reddick, man, cast. he was so damn good. Yes, and uh, Ian McShane. Ian McShane. Is, I also have to give a shout out to um, uh, my man O'Reilly from from Oz. Oh my god, what mm-hmm. is his name? Oh my god, if what's his name? John Wick. Dean something. I can't remember his name. Oh, Dean Winters. Mm-hmm. Dean Winters. I wanted to say Summers. Okay, good. Winters. Dean oh, Winters. Dude. Yeah. That guy is such a great actor, man, and he gets he no is. credit. He yeah, really absolutely. gets no credit for anything and, he's ever done. And as you see him in this movie, it's like, ah, it's the Michael Madsen-esque character. It is. That's exactly the role he's playing. It's yeah. like the 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 Russian is is kind of like, you know, he's the bad guy, but then your yeah. your uh Ian McShane is your Harvey Keitel, right? That's yeah. who he is. He's your wise man who knows everything. And your Michael Madsen is that guy. That's exactly that's a yeah. great analogy. Well done, John. Well, thanks. Uh, I thought of it while I was watching it, and I was like, "There's no way that's Michael Madsen." And I didn't recognize it as Dean Winters at first. And I was like, "There's no way that's Michael Madsen." Michael Madsen's way older than this now. Well, but... you haven't watched Oz, right? No, I haven't. Yeah. So, like, what else would you know Dean Winters from? Uh he was a guest spot on Brooklyn Nine Nine. Was he a recurring a recurring guest on that show? And he's um, he's the mayhem guy, but I know that like yeah. I don't know if you guys get that. I mean, I don't think you get auto insurance commercials in Canada. No, not your auto insurance, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. So like for you, it's like all right, what what the hell is that going to do for you? That's not going to help you at all. Yeah, and, and I mean, we what we also had that cameo from or that small role from Clark Peters in the Continental as he's coming to like clean everything up, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Like, and that and that's what John Wick does so well. It's like these aren't big name actors. I mean, Keanu's the only, I guess Willem Dafoe's here, but Willem Dafoe's also just this character actor. He's Willem Dafoe's a massive, actor. he's a massive name, but he's he's not in as much of this movie as I remembered him being in. No, no, he's very much a side character in this movie. Yeah. And it, it's very interesting that Marcus's death is a second inciting incident, because that's something that a lot of movies don't have. Yeah, a lot of movies struggle to figure out, okay, so they've accomplished what they need to accomplish. Now what are we going – now we have to, like, drag this out and we have to have some twist that keeps them on. There mm-hmm. is no twist in this. It's nope. just, okay, now Willem Dafoe's character dies, so now John Wick wants to go and now officially wipe out everybody. Also, they'll love the Perkins scene where they say, um, what is it, like your your time at the Continental has come to an end or something like that, and mm-hmm. they all just shoot her? I mean, that part's just amazing, whatever they say to her. Ian McShane yeah. delivers that so perfectly. But yeah, that's a great point about the second inciting incident because a lot of movies, you see them struggling throughout to keep the momentum, keep the momentum, keep the momentum. Mm-hmm. What is it that's going to make this person? Especially when this movie does have two bad guys. Yes. it's It's got the dad and it's got Alfie Allen. And the thing is, once Alfie Allen is dead... What's the point? You don't of the movie need to kill that. the dad yeah. to accomplish everything because really the dad didn't do anything at that point. Mm-hmm. Which, again, builds this character of John Wick. We understand this character because Marcus doesn't die. John Wick just walks away. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. nothing else happens here. Karazar doesn't need to die, but yep. he does. And but he does. It keeps going. Yeah. <laughs> These movies, watching either of these, and we're wrapping up anyway, either of these movies, when you were watching it, make you want to watch something else? Like, was there something that jumped to mind where you're like, damn, I got to rewatch, yada, yada, yada? I don't think, uh, I don't know. Um, You know what? Watching both of them, I, I really need to get around to the raid. I haven't watched it yet. It's got a lot of high praise, and it's like one of those high pace action movies. I really need to watch it. Who directed the raid? Uh, let me check here. Because that's one I also have not seen that I probably should get on at some point. Um, that was Gareth Evans. Gareth Evans. Yeah. Wait, that's not the guy who did Rogue One. No. That's what um... else did he do? That's Gareth Edwards. Yeah. Uh, he did, he did the raid VHS did... two. So he pretty much did nothing else. Yeah, that's crazy. He's only direct. Yeah. He's only directed eight things and TV series and okay. Yeah, I haven't mm-hmm. seen the rape. Yeah. So that's definitely no, that one. Is, I know it has a lot of praise, and it is mm-hmm. again this like nonstop adrenaline type movie. 
Uh, that thinking about it now, dread. The, yeah, I the, actually the, haven't oh, seen that one. That's one I should that, definitely watch. It's a good one. It's written by Alice Garland, which uh, might come mm -hmm. up in a little bit here. You're ready and, to talk about them. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really enjoy that movie, and it's kind of like the same deal with like that escalating, mm -hmm. continuous action type movie. Uh, yeah, I think those ones. What about you? It, it really was just nobody. That was just where yeah. I kept going. Yeah, it yeah, really was fair. just nobody. It made me though want to explore some more like Asian action films because that was that's mm -hmm. definitely a genre that I'm lacking in. Yeah, and so it did make me want to go watch that for sure. And honestly, it kind of got me to say, you know what, Monkey Man might deserve a little bit of my time. So we'll see. We'll mm -hmm. see. We'll see. Yeah. No promises. Um, next week we're actually going to be joined by guests, potentially two, definitely one, potentially two. John, I think you know this. The MCU's Bleeding Edge. They're going to yes, join us. For, yes. We're going to be talking 28 Days Later and Sunshine. And so Jeff from the MCU's Bleeding Edge is definitely going to be joining us. There might also be another person joining him. Excited to have that collaboration. Um, and then I'm actually going to be jumping on Jeff's podcast next Friday, which is the 19th. Um, we're going to be talking about Doom Part 2. So I'm going to be jumping over there. But there, he's going to be jumping on on Monday. Maybe we'll get some collabs going back and forth. And like we said, 28 days later and sunshine. So really excited to talk about both of those. If you're not a patron, become a patron. Patreon.com slash a specialist. If you like hearing us talk about movies, $5 a month gets you at least four movie podcasts every single month. We put one out every Tuesday. Uh, tomorrow's is going to be Shaun of the Dead. The next week after that will be Shrek 2. So we jump a little all over. Right now, April, we're doing as April Fool's, so we're going with comedies. We did Life of Brian to start the month. But as I've said, if you haven't started, if you haven't become a patron yet, you can go back and you can re-listen to all the ones we've done all the way back to mm -hmm. January. The Sixth Sense, When Harry Met Sally, License to Kill. We did Batman, the Tim Burton one. So there's plenty that you can jump in and listen to. We have a lot of content. And then in the additional bonus, if you are a Survivor fan, which I assume many of you are, you get all of the Survivor content as well. So thank you all so much for listening. Go follow Cinema Specialists on social media. On Twitter, you can find us, Cinema Specialists. And like this video, subscribe to the channel. And we will see you next Monday night when we are joined by the MCU's Bleeding Edge at 8 o'clock to talk about 28 Days Later and Sunshine. And if you haven't watched, Go watch our Godzilla video. Please, for the love of God, get it to triple digits.